I struggle every day. There's this tool that the therapy teaches you. It's like when you're struggling and you're having anxiety, you feel out of control, just get yourself into the moment. Like look at your moment and concentrate on the things around you in that moment. And then my brain says, yeah, you're experiencing this moment without Zach. And now you're experiencing this moment without him again. And now this one. So... I am trying to live patiently until I see him again. Trying to fill in a bunch of good moments in there, even though I have to do them without him. He was a huge baby, nine pounds, seven ounces. He was colicky for the first six months of his life. Always wanted to have a good time. He always wanted to have a good time. Zachariah, when he passed away, was 23 years old. We, as a family, had found out about his heroin addiction when he was 18. I found out and immediately um, asked for him to go, well, required that he go into rehab. So at 18, he went into rehab for the first time, and we had fought to keep him alive ever since. We were so fortunate to experience sober Zachariah and um, experience him and his personality finally coming out. You know, when you're 18, you don't even know who you are yet. And that's when we found out he was addicted and all his behavior in between 18 until he um, had his real push for sobriety at the end of 2021. It was just, you know, his, his addiction that you've seen mostly. It wasn't Zachariah. It was his addiction that we've seen most of in those years. It had started, I had um, seen a lot of behaviors. I put him back into therapy when he was in high school because he wasn't passing any of his grades. He was failing so many courses. And um, I'm like, something's going on, something is wrong. Even found him with a small baggie of cocaine one day, and of course, it's somebody else's. It's somebody else's, I promise you, it's somebody else's. And I revealed it to him in front of the therapist. So she and I both were like, yeah. So I knew something was going on as soon as high school, whenever that incident, he was just acting very, um, it was bad behavior, not concentrating. He was always a decent student, but whenever this started happening, there was like, he was so far behind. He wasn't gonna pass high school. If I had not worked with the counselors, he probably would have failed high school. He was already in the throes of addiction. He was in it. I just didn't know it. I just didn't know it. That's why he was in therapy. I was trying to get him to reveal to a third party what was going on, and he didn't. He never revealed it. Um, he stopped going to therapy. He barely passed high school, and then he got into college. And then I seen a lot of his first semester. His first semester was him struggling and one day after school, I picked him up, because I picked him up every day, dropped him off, picked him up every day from U of H. And um, he realized he could not control his addiction. It was out of control. Just a lot of struggle with him, because you only see the bad behavior. That's, you know, as humans, we only see the bad behavior. We don't understand what's going on in the background. And the background was the addiction. It was his, his desperation to try to re regain control 
of his behavior and his thought process. And he didn't want to share, like he was too scared to share that he had lost control. So we struggled with um, a lot of behaviors. It was the wedding, uh, my niece's wedding, that kind of triggered everything uh, flowing out, basically, that um, he was so high and so messed up and so desperate that night at the party, at the wedding, that he told two people that he was out of control, but not to tell nobody. Don't tell nobody. He told everyone. The two people he told not to tell anyone. Well, one of them was a young woman that my son was semi-dating, and right when she heard what Zachariah said to her, to her he, she immediately knew she had to tell, even though she was sworn not to tell. She told my oldest son, and it was his baby brother. We, they're separated by 11 years, and he, he acts more like his daddy role than just a brother. And he just, he um, realized what was going on, talked to Jake, Zachariah. They decided to detox <laughs> behind my back. <sighs> he spent four or five days in his room downstairs. Jacob, my oldest, asked me not to um, ask too many questions that he and Zachariah were working things out. I had no clue that my son was downstairs detoxing from heroin. He detoxed and he swore to his brother that he would never touch the stuff again, that he was over it. He was never going to go back to heroin. And Jacob believed him. And they kept it a secret because, you know, he's sober now. He's sober. Except for I was seeing a lot of bad behaviors again. He was out of control. I caught him hitting himself. I caught him doing a lot of stuff, stealing. And um, uh, one day he was getting ready for work. He was so messed up he couldn't even talk. And I'm like... Zach, something is going on. And he's like, nothing's going on, Mom. And he was so messed up that I knew that was a chance for me to run into his room and see if there was any evidence of any kind of use. So I ran, and he followed me, but he was so messed up he couldn't follow me quickly enough. And I ran into the bedroom, looked in everywhere, looked in the bathroom, and that's where I seen the foil the burnt foil floating in the toilet water. And immediately I'm like, this is what's going on. This is it. What is it? Because I had no clue what it was. And I went upstairs and called his brother, and his brother's like, I know. I'm like, what do you mean you know? Yes, I know. So that day we put him into um, a detox facility, and that was our journey, just constantly trying to save his life. He hated it every day. He would call me two, three times, please get me out of here. He was old enough. He could have checked himself out, but we made it very clear to him that he wasn't going to come back home and that Jacob was not going to take him back in until he did the month, at least a month, in the rehab center. So it was only because we threatened him did he even stay. The day we picked him up, he was like, I can't wait to get drunk. And I'm like, wow, all that money, all that time. <sighs> so it wasn't long before he was using again, and that went on over and over and over again. For many years, I put trackers on him. We paid for his cell phone, so I made sure he always had a tracker on him. He would turn it off sometimes. He would get brave, and he would turn it off. 
but he didn't know that I had another tracker on his car, and the car tracker did not, you know, did not, um, it continued to work even though his cell phone was off. And I had a boundary where I knew where he would buy, and as soon as he would hit that boundary, my alarm on my phone would go off, and I would take off in my car looking for him. And another reason I kept a tracker on him is I said, if anything happens to him, I want to be able to find my baby. I want to be able to find him. He was sober for a year, 16 months. He was sober for 16 months. And I attribute most of it to Vivitrol. Vivitrol is a prescription drug that they are able to take once a month. It's a shot, usually in their butt. And whenever, before he left the rehab last time, I said, the only way that I will feel comfortable with you leaving that facility, facility because I'd done research on it, is you have a Vivitrol shot in you. And the Vivitrol basically blocks opiates um, getting into the brain receptors to be able to get high and drunk. It's the, it works for a few drugs, but opiates. And um, he fought me on it. He's like, I can, I can just take the daily pill. And I'm like, no, I don't trust the daily. I don't trust you enough to take it on the daily. I want a monthly shot. And if you can show me that you have a monthly shot, then I will agree to you leave, for you leaving and us be at peace. You know, me to be at peace that you have left this facility. He actually found a facility that let him stay. It's called a, it's a halfway house. And one of the requirements was that he was on Vivitrol. So every month they wanted to see the receipt where he went to the doctor and he got the shot. And that's the only way he was able to stay. And he did that. I think he was there for three months. And then his brother allowed him to move in with him because he wasn't allowed to move back with me because he had, he had done too many um, criminal activities. I had caught him too many times stealing. Zachariah, in his sobriety, we all got to meet him. He was an amazing person. Even at the halfway house, he's taking his, his roommates to the hospital for, you know, urgent care because they're sick. He's making sure that guys are getting something to eat. He's just always caring about people. The night that my brother passed away, which was December, late December 2021, 20, he um, was on his way to the urgent care, taking one of his halfway house uh, roommates because he was sick to the urgent care. And when I called him and told him, you know, your uncle passed away, he's like, I've got to go and drop this roommate back at the house and make sure somebody else takes him to the urgent care, and then I will be with you immediately as soon as I can, Mom. And that's what he did. Anyway, he was sober. He was doing really well. We, um, he had gotten a job at his uh, brother's law firm as an intake phone caller, and he kept getting advancement, you know, like moving up in the company because he was reliable. He was a leader. He always has been. Even in, while using, he's always been reliable and a leader at his work positions. And um, he got a chance to audition for a local play. 33 people, I think they told me, had auditioned for his part. And he blew them all away. He got the part of Carl, which was, um, there's only four or five characters in the play, but he was blown away that he got that part. He says, because wa I watched some other people audition for that part. He's like, Mom, I might not get it because some guy, they're just amazing. These people have been doing it for years. This is my first audition ever. I, I don't think I'm going to get it, but... I want it so bad. So um, I think it was about two weeks after the audition is when we found out he got he got the part. And he was very excited. We were very excited for him. Um, he was still working his full-time job. Jacob, his older brother, he was living with him. 
told him, you know what, I make enough money um, to take care of the household and everything. He goes, um, if you want to, you can quit your day job and concentrate on studying for your part and um, just dedicate you, yourself to your art and think about going back to school. And Zachariah was talking to me about going back to U of H for um, camera, media, kind of like what you do. <laughs> That's what he wanted to go back to school for. My oldest son gave me the best Christmas gift ever. He gave me, um, on December of 22, he gave me a trip to go to the mansion, Paisley Park, Prince's mansion. And he and I are huge Prince fans. And we did this big trip. He paid for everything. He paid for the airline. He paid for the hotel. He paid for the ultimate tour. And I was all purpled out. I had every purple outfit I could get my hands on. <laughs> because I wanted all my pictures in Minneapolis to be purple. And we had a great time. Zachariah was left at home to practice because he had rehearsals still. And the week that we were going to come back, he was supposed to have his first opening night that Friday. We had gone to the tour on Saturday. The next day, we're like, we're at the... We're in Minneapolis. The other thing, the only other thing that we want to do to be able to say, I did this, was go to the Mall of America, because everybody has to go to the Mall of America. So we got a phone call on our way to the shuttle that Zachariah did not show up at the um, rehearsal that morning. And Jacob got concerned. We all got concerned, and we're like, you know what? He might have... He might have bought something and used. He did not take his Vivitrol the past two months. He was saying he was strong enough. Maybe he planned this. He planned to use while we were out of town because the only two people that would have known immediately that he was using were going to be out of town. So I said, maybe he is using. I go, but it's okay. I go, it's okay. We'll put him back in rehab. We'll do anything that we need to do to get him back on track. He and I discussed it. We were like, it's fine. It's fine if he's using. We'll get him back on his feet. It'll be fine. Then we get to the mall. We start shopping, looking around. He sends his friend Sarah, his only friend that has a house key, to go check on Zachariah. We walk into a store and Jacob's like, Sarah's at the house. Oh, good, okay. She's walking in the house. I'm like, okay, good. And then all of a sudden he goes, oh, she said that she needs to let me go and that she'll call me back. And I said, okay, well, maybe he, maybe she walked in on him with the woman or, you know, in the apartment, in the house. Maybe he caught, she caught something that she didn't want to see. And she's going to call us back once she talks to Zach and tell us what's up. So we're still shopping, waiting for the phone call. Jake ben, Jacob decides that he's going to go get a coffee, and I move on to other stores. And then I keep calling Jacob because I can't see him anymore. I'm like, where are you? We're at the Mall of America. And it's so big, and he won't answer. He won't answer his phone. And then I text him, like, where are you? And I get a text back, I'm at the store where we left each other, which was in front of an H&M. So I walk back to the store, and I see him staring at me. So I'm like, Jacob, here I am. And he just keeps staring. And I'm like, Jacob, I'm right here. Like, I'm right here. And he's just staring, not responding to me. And the closer I get, I'm like, what the hell? Why aren't you talking to me. And then he's like, and I'm like, he didn't even have to say anything. He's like, Mom. And I'm like, no. He's like, Mom. And I'm like, no. Tell me you're joking. Tell me you're joking right now. He's like, no, Mom. 
And I just started hitting him. Like, tell me you're joking. And I'm beating on his chest. And he's walking back because he's just like devastated also. Beat him into a column in the middle of the freaking mall. And we both collapse on the floor. Just me screaming, like, not my baby. Not my baby. Everybody was, like, spreading away. It was so strange. They just, like, they were scared. And one couple came up. It's like, is everything okay? And my son looked up. He's holding me, and he's like, my brother just died. This is my mother, our mother. And they're like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And everybody just kind of stayed away. And the couple's like, is there anything we can do? I'm like, and I was like just in my fog of screaming. I think I was screaming, sobbing. I don't even remember much of it, just crying, my baby, not my baby. And this man came up to Jacob. He's like, what's, no, he went up to the couple, and the couple was closer to us, and like, what's going on? And the couple told him they just lost their brother and son, and... This man says, goes up to Jacob. He's like, people die all the time, dude. Get over it. And Jacob is like, you need to get away from me. He said, he put me down because I was in his arms. He's like, you better get, you know what, that for me. And then the security guard came over and he's like, you need to leave. I'm like, what? Like, not one person in that whole, like, how many stores there were around us? How many managers were in all those stores? They could have easily just came over to us and grabbed us and, like, come to our office until you can calm down, until you can get yourself, you know, more together. No. Security guard came over and told us to leave the store, that we were disrupting the store, the mall. They literally escorted us out of the Mall of America because we were disturbing them. The Uber driver was so sweet who picked us up. He, we tried not to cry and as loud as we wanted to. He was super sweet. He's like, I lost my brother recently. I know what you're going through. And um, get to the hotel room. We're packing, because now we have to leave as soon as possible. <sighs> Because we just wanted to be as close as we could to him. And me and his brother took turns breaking down. It was so weird. I would be packing and then I would just be overwhelmed. Like, not my baby. And I'm overwhelmed and I'm shaking. And Jacob came over and just hugged me and held me. And, and then... We'd get together, and then he'd start, we'd both start packing, and then he would have a breakdown. It's like, not my baby. And that's how we packed. Like, it took, I don't know how long it took just to get our clothes in bags and packed, and we're just, like, zoned out. Airport people. Oh. They were tired of us crying, so they asked us to move to a secluded area. And then they put our seats, they changed our seats to the vat, the very last row, so we wouldn't disturb other people. And then the stewardess made a big mistake on my way out the airport airplane. She's like, everything's gonna be okay, sweetie. And then I just lost it. It's like, my baby is dead. How is everything going to be okay? My baby is dead. And she was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so she apologized immediately, but she just, it was just like, I have 
have no clue what this feels like. I think one of the biggest things I struggle with is he had um, he had struggled, you know, especially from his addiction, to find what he wanted to do in life. But when he started acting, he always acted. I think he always acted. Even when I put him in a in a special engineering school, <laughs> I put him in a magnet engineering high school to. Um, help him maybe look into engineering and maybe that's something he would like to do. He was acting and doing producing films without any act. There's no acting club at the engineering school. There was just Zachariah's urge to produce short films and he would do this with his engineering students, co-students. Um, he's so silly. He's in an engineering school and he's producing short films. <laughs> he's always wanted to be in films, produce films. He had me set up green walls, green back walls for him. We've done all these silly things and I'm just like, when he, as the adult, as the sober Zachariah, did that audition and realized what he wanted to, like, he's like, I found it, Mom. Found it. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. And his director is so talented. He's he's discovered a couple, at least a couple of famous actors in Hollywood right now. And that director's like, this kid's got it. This kid has got it. I'm going to follow him every step of the way. I know he's going to be amazing. So Zachariah had found his calling and the only thing is he still had that addiction. And I just know that once he knew that we were going to go to Minneapolis, he's like, I'm just going to use one more time. I'm going to use one more time, and I'm going to go to my audition. You know, I'm going to go to my practice, and I'm going to be fine. That's what his thought process was. He would, did not want to die he was making breakfast. If fentanyl was not in that heroin, Zachariah would have just gotten a high and we would have been able to help him again to get sober. And I would be watching my son's career blossom And I would watch him actually live the life that he wanted to live. But the addiction was so strong, and the fentanyl was the poison. It was the poison that killed him.